Walker. Hey dolls, it's me, Wilma Fingerdo, with another Makeup and Movies. This week, the makeup is all about ColourPop. I have a couple of palettes from them, some glitter gel, some setting powder, and some lippy. And this week's movie is my favorite, Victor Victoria. It's one of the last great studio films, in my opinion. The whole thing was shot in Pinewood Studios in England. It was uh, fully costumed, fully designed. It is not just a great period film. It's a great comedy film. It's a great musical. And it deals with a lot of LGBTQI issues that at the time weren't necessarily prevalent in society. But watching this film now with the information and the awareness that we have in this day and age, it's an incredibly insightful film when you think about when it was made. So, if you want to see how I throw all this on my face and learn something about a fabulous movie, then just stay tuned. Okay, so uh, it's ColourPop Day. I've got not a lot of ColourPop. I have to tell you, I uh, the only reason that I bought any ColourPop makeup in the first place was for this palette, Blowing Smoke. And this was out of stock forever. So when it did come in stock, I wanted to get this. I also got uh, On Cloud Blue, and because, you know, shipping's free if you buy a few other things, there were actually other things that I wanted, and ColourPop made them. One of them was uh, Gel Glitter. This is their You Are Fireworks. Uh, it is, I love it. This is just, I think, the best idea for, I mean, it looks disgusting, but literally it's just gel with glitter in it and you tap it on into the areas you want and it's spectacular. Uh, the other thing that I got, setting powders, and I got their soft pink and I got their peach and these are exactly as advertised. I just find baking with these it just gives you that warmer tone than a, a stark white. I also got a lipstick. Now I'm very particular about lipstick. I don't like anything too red aka Hori. So they had this one and it's called uh, Super Bloom and it's it's all right. It's uh, I thought it would be pinker. It's a little more bricky or, or corally than I, I would have liked. It's not the worst thing but because I do a highlight of white it does actually tone this down a lot. So let's get started. Today's movie, Oh Sweet Marie and the Ships at Sea. Victor Victoria is just for me it's a musical, it's about drag queens or kings in this case, which I just think is so great. And the musical numbers, the wardrobe, the period this movie's set, it's in the 30s, like Art Deco at its, at its just most delicious. And the, so the wardrobe, it's just a brilliant, brilliant movie. But also, what I like about this movie is uh, it was done in 82, this is just when uh, the AIDS epidemic was starting. So there was still a joie to being gay, but it was still taboo. People didn't really talk about it. And this movie kind of inadvertently addresses a lot of topics, issues. It's just one of those films where I think it's a great time capsule because it's not marred by the AIDS epidemic. It's not about that. It's set in the 30s. Now, in France and Paris, uh, it wasn't illegal to be gay. Uh, they, they abolished a same-sex law, an anti-gay law, in, in, uh, after the French Revolution, 1700s. So Paris was a place where a lot of people at that time settled uh, to live a life that wasn't being ostracized politically. I'm not saying that it wasn't... <laughs> still judged by by people. Now, this movie, as I say, was done in 1982 at MGM. The director is Blake Edwards, and Blake Edwards is famous for Operation Petticoat with Cary Grant and Tony Curtis. He then directed, his second movie that he directed was Breakfast at Tiffany's. Huge, huge movies. And then, of course, he did all the Pink Panther movies starring Peter Sellers. What's interesting about this film is that in 1982, there were three movies, Victor Victoria, Tootsie, and The World According to Garp. And if you haven't seen The World According to Garp, it was 
Glenn Close's first movie. It starred Robin Williams and John Lithgow as a transgendered female. This is 82. I don't even think people talked about transgender issues or even knew that much about them at the time. And what's interesting is everyone was nominated for an Oscar. Dustin Hoffman for Tootsie, Julie Andrews for Victor Victoria, and John Lithgow for The World According to Garp. None of them won. Now, one of the reasons why none of them won was another movie that had been released that year was Gandhi. Huge, huge Oscar winner. I think uh, Victor Victoria only won one Oscar, even though they had beautiful costume and set design, even though the script was brilliant, and even though the direction was sublime. Uh, it only won one Oscar for... Uh, original score uh, and songs. I mean, on one level, it won an Oscar. It totally deserved because the music in Victor Victoria is almost like another character in the movie, but it, it, it was a hard year for these films. I mean, I think Dustin Hoffman should have won an Oscar because I think his portrayal of uh, Michael Dorsey slash Dorothy Michaels was brilliant. But as far as Victor Victoria goes, she and her husband, Blake Edwards, had been developing this script since 78, 79. Because of that, and Blake Edwards' involvement with the Pink Panther films, I mean, he worked with Peter Sellers a lot. And their intention had always been to have Peter Sellers play Toddy, Carol Todd, the role that Robert Preston ended up playing. But what unfortunately happened was Peter Sellers died. So they couldn't. I'm not sure that Peter Sellers would have done a bad role, but there's just some nuances that I felt Robert Preston brought to the role. And one of them was his hair. He just had the most beautiful head of gray hair that just, the way they styled it and fluffed it up, it just made him look gay. It was just hilarious. And because of his musical theater background, he certainly had <laughs> some inspirations <laughs> there to draw on for sure. What's also interesting is that Robert Preston had been in movies since the late 30s, early 40s. And this movie was his only Oscar nomination. He had never been nominated for an Oscar before this. As I say, the only Oscar that was awarded to this movie went to Henry Mancini and uh, Leslie uh, Bricuse. It won Best Original Song and Score. Another thing about this movie that is just beyond brilliant is the costumes. I mean, it's the 30s. This film was set in Paris in 1934. All the dresses are on the bias. All the women look like flappers. The attention to detail in this movie, you can see it. it the money was well spent. And <clears throat> the designer, Patricia Norris, uh, she was nominated for an Oscar as well, but she didn't win. Gandhi won. But she had done this was a really interesting film for her to do because she does period films, but her first film was Capricorn One in 1977. And then she did The Elephant Man, which was a period movie in 1980. And then she did Blue Velvet in 86 with David Lynch. And in fact, worked with him on a couple of projects after that. And her last film was 12 Years a Slave, which she was also nominated for an Oscar for. Now, this film wasn't an original concept. Uh, Blake Edwards adapted it from a German film from 1933 called Victor and Victoria. This movie also stars James Garner as the romantic lead. It wasn't the first time he and Julie Andrews had worked together. They had worked on a movie together in 64 called The Americanization of Emily. There was a rumor that James Garner wasn't the first ch choice or that they had wanted Tom Selleck to play this part. But Blake Edwards is adamant in saying that the only choice for this role was and always had been James Garner. And, and he's just brilliant in it. Another, speaking of brilliant, another person in this film, just brilliant, Leslie Ann Warren. She plays Norma Cassidy. James Garner's character's girlfriend. She's a gangster's mall and she's got blonde hair and she talks like this and she just, listen you, and she's just very crass. And although she looks spectacular, she is hard as bricks. 
So the movie starts out with, we see a man lying in bed. This is uh, Carol Todd, played by Robert Preston. And as he's lying there, a second figure raises up out of the bed, and it's a man. So right away, this film just gives you gay right in the face, <laughs> which is where you want it, <laughs> just saying. So he gets up out of bed, he gets dressed, and he starts, he goes through Toddy's wallet to just grab some money. And Toddy wakes up. They have an exchange. He says, oh, cab fare. And he goes, I have to pay some bills. And he says to Carol, you get your money's worth. So now we know, okay, well, Carol Todd's, Toddy is, uh, their relationship is a money <laughs> one. But Toddy gets up and uh, he goes to work. He works at Shea Louis, literally around the corner, like just a couple of steps away. As we get closer to this nightclub, we can hear singing. A woman is singing. And when he goes into the club, we see Victoria Grant. She, Grant, she's singing uh, at on stage with an accompanist auditioning for Shea Louis. And she's singing some operatic piece of loveliness, Cherry Ripe. And she sounds f fantastic. And Labis is the owner of the nightclub. He's sitting there listening to her, and she does a great job. And when she's done, she says, uh, as you can see, Monsieur Labis, I have a legitimate voice. And he said, yes, but what we're looking for here is something a little more illegitimate. <laughs> and uh, she says, well, I'm sure with a little practice. And he says, well, that would be like saying with a little practice, a nun could be a streetwalker. And so... Victoria kind of leaves in a, a bit of a huff over this. And then she says to him, despite what you may think, there are some things where practice does make perfect. And she hits this high note. Ah! And the glass of wine on his table just explodes. And when she's done, she... Ah! And then she she fades a little. You can see <laughs> that took a lot out of her. And, and she stumbles her way out of the place. And Labie says, what the hell was that? And Toddy says, uh, E flat. We see Victoria leave. She stops outside this restaurant. And we see this very large man eating the most decadent pastry. I don't even know what it is. But there's cream, whipped cream, and flakiness going on. And, and she's just staring at him, eating and. Every time we see him, we get closer with the camera to the point where you can see the hairs out of his nostrils. And as he bites into this thing, cream sticks to his nose. And they cut to the broad shot where Victoria was standing outside the window. She's not standing there anymore. But the people outside are all like, oh, and they're picking her up. She's fainted. And it, she, clearly this is not a good day for Victoria Grant. So she arrives at her rooming house. And as she walks in, the young lad at the front desk calls the manager. Just as she's putting her key in the door, he stops her. And clearly he was eating. She takes her umbrella and hangs it. He's got his hand blocking her door and she puts her umbrella on his hand. Pulls, she's got a hole in her glove. Pulls it down so her finger's exposed. Runs it down his handkerchief and licks it and goes, Spaghetti? He goes, with meatballs. And she goes, I'll sleep with you for a meatball. And he grabs his glass and goes, what? She just faints. And he brings her into the room and she goes, no, 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 you don't. I know all the angles. And he puts her on the bed and she's like, what's happening? You made an offer to me and then you pretended to faint. She goes, don't be ridiculous. I never pretend to faint. And he's starting to take his pants off and she's like, what's going on? And that's when she sees this cockroach on the bed and she screams. She just freaks out and knocks him to the ground. His pants are down around his ankles. I mean, clearly this was not going to go well for Victoria. The guy is just beside himself. He confiscates her bags and says, you're not getting these back until I get my rent. So we cut from that scene to, <laughs> poor thing, poor Victoria, to back to Shea Louis. It's now in full swing. There are patrons there, and Carol Todd is performing. As he's singing, he's going through the club, and you can see the patrons. A lot of the people, at first glance, it's just men and women sitting at tables. Then you realize that a lot of the women are men, and a lot of the men, you realize, are women with their hair kind of marcelled flat to their heads. And so as Carol's singing this song, there's a commotion uh, at the front door as this quartet of people walk in. And one of them is this Richard DiNardo, 
who Carol had the exchange with that morning. And they get to their table and while he's singing, like they even yell out for the waiter. So at the end of it, Toddy says, thank you. Thank you to the crowd. You're, you're, you're most kind. And then he's, in fact, you're all, you're every kind. (laughs) And, oh, we have a celebrity in the audience tonight. Aren't you Richard DiNardo, uh, the famous trapeze act? (laughs) Clearly he's a swinger. And he just insults the whole table and, this older woman says, you aren't really funny, you know, so why don't you just frig off? And he says, shame on you, bringing your dear sweet old mother into a place like this. And he walks away. The the guy gets up with a chair and comes at Toddy, who ducks, and a fight, a huge fight ensues. Just all hell is breaking loose. And while that's all going on, we cut to this restaurant that Victoria was out front of earlier and she is now entering the restaurant. She sits at a table and starts looking through a menu. We cut back to Shay Louis. The cops have raided the place and taken everybody out. And in his frustration at the whole situation, Labisse fires Toddy. As he's working his way through the streets of Paris, he comes across the restaurant where Victoria is in. And there she is eating at a table by herself. He recognizes her and So he goes in, he goes over to Victoria and introduces himself. I'm Carol Todd, Toddy to nearly everyone who knows me. So she invites him to have dinner with him. And he said, oh, I would have thought that you were just at the end of your rope. And she goes, I was, I am. And then she explains to him that she has a cockroach in her bag and she's going to whip it out at the right moment and not have to pay for her meal. While this is all going on, there's this waiter in the restaurant. He is played by Graham Stark, who was good friends with Peter Sellers. They uh, were in television in the BBC together, and subsequently he was in all of the Pink Panther movies, so he worked with Blake Edwards a lot. And he plays this waiter who's just over it. When Carol Todd joins Victoria in the restaurant, he says, how was the boeuf bourguignon? Well, it was a little tough. And he says, well, maybe the way you're eating, your jaws are getting tired. And he said, speaking of overworked jaws, why don't you treat yours to a sabbatical and fetch me a wine list? And she says... This is all they have. And he says, oh, the last time I saw a specimen like this, they had to shoot the horse. And he says, how lucky can you be? And one night, a Groucho Mar- a Rockefeller and a Groucho Marx. And Robert Preston says, well, it wasn't a real horse. It was just a costume with two waiters in it. And he says, I will think of a clever retort as I get your salad. And Robert Preston says, it's a wise man who knows when to throw in the towel and the waiter says, and it is a moron who tries to give advice to a horse's ass and walks away. And he's just brilliant. Anyway, so it gets to the point in the evening where she's going to dump the cockroach in her salad. She shakes it, her purse over the salad and nothing. They look. He says, anything to do. And as they're looking, they're like over the table looking at this salad. The waiter shows up, how is the salad? She's like, ah! Apparently he made the rosé dressing. So he wants to find out from her how she enjoys it and... As they're as they're talking, the cockroach crawls out of the purse onto Julie Andrews' hand, and she, ah! and she screams and she jumps up. She knocks the waiter over. She uh, everything, the salads everywhere. It's just awful. And they have this confrontation with the the maitre d. As this is all going on, there's a large woman in the other side of the restaurant who's just staring at them, judgy, judgy. And they pan down to her foot, and the cockroach has crawled onto her foot. And then it starts up her leg, and then they cut back to her face. She screams. All hell breaks loose in the restaurant. It's pan- pandemonium. And as that's all happening, Victoria and uh, Toddy run out of the restaurant. She's got her coat in her hand. It's raining. We cut to the next scene, which is uh, in Toddy's apartment. We see that the two of them have been sitting in the tub together with the hot water drinking brandy. And Julie Andrews asks him, how long had he been a homosexual? And he says, how long have you been a soprano? And uh, she said, since I was 14, I was a late bloomer. And they're just getting to know each other. It's so lovely. It's so charming. And she's like, all right, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my clothes on and try and sneak back into my hotel. And as she does that, she realizes that her clothes have shrunk from the rain. And she's like, oh, it was guaranteed not to shrink. And she's just so upset by it all. And so he says, well, you'll stay here. And then tomorrow I'll go to your hotel and I'll pay your bill. And she says, what? And she goes, yeah, it's a, it's one of those 
reasons that I saved a couple of francs for. And so the next day, he's got a cold. He's clearly not happy about being ill, and she's put on Richard Donardo's clothes that he's left there. And he says, you look better in Richard's clothes than he does. The plan is she's going to go to her hotel, pay the bill, get her clothes, and come back. While that's all happening, Richard Donardo shows up. He says, I'm here to pick up my clothes, and Toddy says, oh, I, I thought it was to pay me the money you owe me. And he goes, I don't owe you a thing, you pathetic old queer. And he goes to the wardrobe, which is where Victoria is hiding. And he opens the door. She has since put on a hat of his. And he looks at what looks like a man in the cupboard and she punches him in the nose, just square off smackaroo. And she kicks him out of the apartment. Toddy, his face is like, and he has an idea. This is what sparks the idea. He could sell her off as as a female impersonator. He's going to take him to see Andre Cassel, the, 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 the best agent in Paris. And he's like, you're the world's greatest female impersonator. And he, she says, well, if I'm the greatest, how come he's not heard of her? And he's like, well, you, you uh, were famous in Poland and I brought you to Paris. And so they get in a cab and go off to Andre Cassel's office. And in his office is another delicious character, Miss Selma. She's the secretary for Andre Cassel. So they come in and Toddy says, uh, I'd like to see Andre Cassel. And she says, why? And he's like, because we're friends. And when he knows I'm here, he'll want to see me. And she says, well, seeing as you're such good friends, I'm surprised you don't know that on Wednesdays, Andre Cassel only sees the world's greatest barber He's getting his hair cut in his office. So they decide to wait. And while they're sitting there in the office waiting, a man in a tuxedo shows up. And he goes up to the secretary's desk. She's typing away. And she looks at him and he says, Andre Cassell? And she goes, no, Miss Selma. And he's like, no, I want to see Andre Cassell. And she's like, no. And he says, I am Le Clue, the world's greatest equilibrist. And she says, well, on Wednesdays, Andre Cassell only sees so-and-so, the world's greatest barber. And he says, fine, then I will perform for you. And he, he opens the bottle of champagne, pours a glass, gives it to Miss Selma, puts the bottle on the table, gets up on the table, puts his walking stick on top of the bottle, and then stands up on his one arm on top of the desk, on top of the bottle. And he's just balancing there. And she's like, get off, get off. She comes running around. And so while she's kind of dealing with him there, Toddy and, and Victoria run into Andre's office. And you can hear him going, Toddy, what the hell? And she's like... I want you to meet Count Grzynski, the world's greatest female impersonator. Count, will you demonstrate? And she goes, of course. And then we hit this high note again, and the bottle of champagne smashes. Leclou hits the, it falls through the coffee table that's in the uh, waiting room, uh, and they all come running out of the office to see this. Then we cut to a series of shots of her rehearsing. It's funny because there's one scene where she's going over the choreography. As they're rehearsing, Toddy comes in and he stands behind a bunch of, I don't know, chorus boys, dancers. One of them says, well, if he's a count, then I'm Greta Garbo. And another one says, well, Greta, (laughs) I think he's divine. And what's interesting to know about that scene is the boy that says, I think he's divine, is Blake Edwards' son. Then it's opening night and Victoria's in her dressing room and there's a knock at the door and it's uh, Andre Cassell and he says, because uh, it's opening night, he's like, everyone's here. I sent out 300 invitations and almost everyone's here. The only person that didn't come was King Marchand and King Marchand is played by James Garner and they're like, well, who's King Marchand? He is the largest nightclub owner in Chicago. As they're talking about him, we cut to the nightclub and we see James Garner enter with his bodyguards Squash and Leslie Ann Warren, Norma, Norma Cassidy, and the show starts. And it's stunning. Like, Julie Andrews looks good. The costume films beautifully. The number's great. And while the number's going on, you can see that King is getting more and more intrigued by this creature on stage. And Norma, a couple times, kind of looks over at him and is like, And you can see that she is not happy. And she knows, like, he's going to dump her for this woman. At the end of the number, Victoria takes off her wig. And James Garner has the best reaction to it. Because he's he's clapping and smiling. He's quite happy. And and he's like... And then... And then... His hands almost, like, reverse clap. Like, as he... Like, they... It's the most controlled 
reaction to something like that. It just made me laugh so hard, I remember, at the time. And it still does when I see it. And Squash leans into King and says, she's a man. And Norma's reaction is, yeah. And she starts screaming and cheering. She couldn't be happier. She, her relationship with King is safe. And so there's, after the show, there's like a, everyone's back at Victoria's dressing room and King and Norma show up. And there's an exchange between Victoria and King. They shake hands and he squeezes her hand. And she kind of looks at him and squeezes back. And she brings up, well, you, you find it hard to believe that I'm a man because you found me attractive as a woman. While that's all happening, Norma's talking to Toddy outside. And she goes, oh, my God, you really are queer? And he laughs at her and goes, we prefer gay. And she's like, well, I just bet that the right woman could reform you. And he says, I think the right woman could reform you, too. And she's like, me? Give up men? Forget it. And he says, you took the words right out of my mouth. And as that's all happening, King is leaving and Squash yells to Norma, come on, let's go. And off they go. While they're leaving, Norma's saying to King, no, no, they, they, are, they are a couple. I, he explained the whole thing to me. They met in Poland or something. And she goes, can you imagine what your business partner, Sal Andretti, would say if he found out you fell for a female impersonator? Ah! As she's walking out of the place saying that, King goes to kick her. <laughs> like He's clearly over this woman. Victoria and Toddy leave. Andre Cassell gives them a lift to their hotel, and they actually are staying in the same hotel that King and Squash and Norma are in. Victoria's just gobsmacked. Why are we here? This is the Marceau. Where are we going? And he says, up! And so they enter the hotel into their room. It's stunning. She's like, when did we move? He goes, he's apparently that afternoon. And while they're celebrating her success and how well it all went, across the courtyard, there's King Marchand. <laughs> he's standing at the window and he sees across the way Victor and Toddy. And, and they're hugging and kissing. And while that's all happening, Norma... <laughs> appears in the doorway of the bedroom. She's like, mm, I'm horny. And I think he only reacts to this because it's a clear way for him to redefine his heterosexuality. We cut back to Victoria and Toddy's hotel room. They're lying on the bed drinking champagne and they're singing uh, Home on the Range. But instead of uh, where the deer and the antelope play, it's where the deer and the antelope are gay. We cut back to King and Norma, and clearly he couldn't perform. And the dialogue here is so funny. Norma is, uh, oh, you know, don't worry about it. You know, women are lucky. We don't have to fake it. I mean, not that I ever have with you. Every time with you, it's like, pow, pow, pow. When she's talking to him, she's playing with his chest hair and pulling on it. And he grabs her hand. It's so funny. And he goes into the bathroom. He gets out of bed and goes into the bathroom, and she's like... You have to, pardon the expression, not let it get you down. <laughs> he comes out of the bed bathroom with a bar of soap. But she's like, what's with the soap? The next thing we hear is a scream from Norma. King comes running out of the one bedroom. Across the living room is another bedroom where Squash is. He comes running out and he yells, look out! And Norma comes to the doorway. She's got soap coming out of her mouth. Nobody puts soap in my mouth, not even my mother. And she wrecks the place. I think it was an interview that Leslie M. Warren gave. She picks up this one vase of flowers over her head and throws it. And as she throws it, all the water in this vase pours out all over her. She's in this silk champagne negligee and immediately it just, she's soaking wet. And she said that they had never rehearsed anything with water in it and that Blake Edwards wanted the water in it because it, it made her matter. It just made the scene even better. I think at the there's a decorative spear in the room on the wall or so she grabs it and runs it through the squash's bedroom door where king and he are hiding and squash says why don't you send her home and he goes why well, i got a better idea why don't you take her home and so the next scene is him walking with norma on a train platform i guess to take her to the the boat to sail back to America and she is just let me tell you something mr big shot fairy marshall and She's just talking. Squash isn't listening to her. She's just ranting and going on. And he gets to the door of the train and she gets into it. 
She never stops talking. He's walking back along the train. She's inside the train. You can't hear her anymore, but she and Squash are still walking side by side, even though she's on the train. And she is, and it's physical. What? She, and she gets to the, he keeps walking and she gets to the end of the train, opens the door, stands at the end. I'll show you, I'll show you all. And she opens her coat and she's got, I guess, a, a girdle panty set on or something underneath. And one guy's like, oh, and falls onto the trash. She's like, oh, mister, are you okay? The next scene is the second big Victor, Victor Victoria musical number, which is the Shady Dame from Seville. And the climax of this number is her hitting a big that big note again and uh, a champagne cork pops, a glass smashes. And well, that just sends the crowd into just extra delicious yumminess. And King and Squasher in the audience, and King clearly is like, come on, let's go. And when they get back to the hotel, King gives the front desk a message on a note for Count Victor Grzynski. And the guy says, oh, thank you. And he goes to put it in a cubby hole. And King says, Count Victor Grzynski. And she says, yes, room 234. He's like, fine. And they go up. When Squash and he get to their hotel room king calls down to the front desk king changes his voice this is mr todd in room 234 i'd like some towels please and frigs off king's outside the the room and the maid comes with the towels and she goes into the room and as the door is closing he sneaks into the the room un, unseen by the maid she sees they're there. They have towels, doesn't understand why she's there with them. So she leaves. And as this happens, Toddy and Victoria come out of the elevator and Victoria's, well, the concierge gave me this, but there's nothing on it. King's hidden in a cupboard, a closet in the bathroom. King sees Victoria get undressed for her bath and sees that she's not a man clearly. Toddy's on the bed and King crawls along the floor to get out of the room and as Toddy's reading you see King behind like on the floor past the bed. He looks and he keeps crawling and there's a moment where Toddy's reading in the paper and he's like and goes back to it. It's just just very subtle. Blake Edwards had a real appreciation for silent films so there's a lot of reactionary acting where there's no talking and it's just situations that clearly explain themselves to you and it's just it's just brilliant anyway so now that king knows we are in victoria's change room at the nightclub and andre cassell is there saying king wants to have dinner with you after the show to discuss you performing in chicago so they do they have dinner in a restaurant they have this back and forth where he's clearly toying with her and trying to make her think that he's way more liberal than he may probably be as a person and at one point he offers her a cigar and she takes it because he clearly looks like she won't so she's like takes the cigar lights it she holds it like this too it's very funny she just the way she holds it, it's very awkward she takes a puff and then immediately starts to cough the next scene is at Chez Louis. Victor and Toddy and King enter with Squash, and the nightclub is a buzz. Regard, c'est le Victor. And they get seated at a table, and the Labis says to uh, this waiter, Take the champagne to table, that table, very special guest. And the waiter turns, and it's the waiter from the restaurant they were in. The owner uh, of the nightclub is now on stage saying, Oh, we have a special guest in the audience. Perhaps we can get uh, Victor to honor us with a song. And and Julie Andrews is no. And of course, Toddy, because he's a whore, is like, yeah, yeah. And he grabs her hand, like, yeah, yeah. And as he grabs her hand, he looks at the waiter and recognizes him. And the waiter looks at him and doesn't re recognize him off the top. And <laughs> pulls Victoria uh, onto the stage. And they do this fantastic number called You and Me. It's charming. And they're, and they're, they're dancing together in it. And at one point, he says, uh, you're leading again. She's like, I'm so sorry. And of course, the crowd is going wild. Here are two men dancing on stage together, and it's fabulous. And uh, King is standing there, or still at the table, but he's watching them perform and clearly just enamored even more with Victoria. And while all that's happening, 
as luck would have it, Richard DiNardo shows up with the same three other people that he was there the last time with, and they're very vocal. They, uh, I think what ended up happening is that the club owner gave their table to uh, Victor and his party, and so now they're just standing there. It's like, what do you mean you gave away our table? And uh, they're, they're being very loud. And as they, Richard DiNardo just goes to walk across he cuts across the stage. It's not really a stage, it's a clear part of the floor where they're performing and Victoria trips him and down he goes and it just starts another brawl. And in the course of this brawl, Victoria slugs James Carter and he goes down like a sack and she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And while they're talking, somebody's coming up behind him with a chair and she's like, and she hits that high note again and the whole room just stops. And the waiter recognizes it and he yells, cockroach! And King and Victoria run the hell out of there. This is the scene where he says, I don't care if you are a man, and kisses her. And then she says after they kiss, I'm not a man. And and he says, I still don't care. Kisses her again. (laughs) That everybody and their brother is being hauled out of this club and clearly going to jail (laughs) And as they're being put in the paddy wagon, that waiter is there and he says to Toddy, cockroach. And he goes, I don't know who, I've never seen this man before in my life. Then we cut to uh, King's hotel room. Squash comes in. And as he walks in, you can hear from King's bedroom moaning and like, "Ah." and so Squash thinks he's being attacked or something, breaks the door down. There's Victoria and King in the bed. And Squash is just staggered. He doesn't know what to say. He's so embarrassed. And he he's knocked the door completely off its hinges. So he picks it up and kind of leaves the room and leaves the door propped against the door frame. And oh, I'm so sorry. So sorry. he walks away. King comes running out of the room and says, Squash, Squash, it's not what you think. And he said, says to him, if a guy like you can admit that you're gay... And he looks at him and says, so can I. And King's face like, like devoid of, like you've never seen a blanker expression on a person. Like, and <laughs> Squash, he goes, you've made me so happy. He gives him a hug and a peck on the cheek and goes to his room and closes the door. And poor King's like, I don't know what to say. So he goes back to his room where Victoria is and she's kind of laughing and saying, like starts to, I guess, lighten the mood and, he's clearly just stymied and she's like what and he says well this trip to Paris is (laughs) a little more than I was expecting and then they have this conversation about the fact that she's publicly a man and he says well you can quit pretending and she's like well I don't know if I want to and he's like well why is that I'm successful now I'm he says what do you what are people going to think and they and she says well I think they're going to think that you're sleeping with a man and he says well how's that going to make you feel it's like well you know I'm a woman but we'll be living a damn lie and she's like well I, I don't think that's what's really bothering you and he says well if you think I'm worried about everyone thinking I'm a fag you're right and so she says something about, well, it was fun while it was it lasted, and she heads back to her hotel room with Toddy. As she walks in, Toddy's in bed having a cup of tea. It's very, very polite and civilized with Squash. Squash is there, full pajamas, sitting next to Toddy in bed, looking a little awkward because he still doesn't know she's a woman. <laughs> and then we cut to uh, King and Squash at... Um, a gym at a, a boxing it looks like a boxing gym or some such thing and squash is holding the heavy bag while king punches it and this is again one of those moments in the movie that i really at 16 really appreciated because king says well when did you know you were gay and squash says well i don't know a time when i didn't know and you know it's just a very honest conversation and uh, as they kind of wrap it up King bumps into somebody on his way to another part of the gym and gets very alpha male on him and says, oh, you know, if he'd like to get himself some gloves, I'll meet him in the ring. It's 
a man and another man, and the other man is clearly an interpreter. The the first man doesn't that that King bumped into doesn't speak English apparently. And well, if you'll just wait a second, he'll be happy to indulge you. And King's like, oh, you happy to indulge me? Who does he think he is? And Squash says he's the French middleweight champion, <laughs> but it's okay. He's gay and smacks King on the ass and walks away. We cut back to the nightclub where Victoria's performing, and now Labisse is there watching her and she hits that high note again the glasses all break and he's like you can see him okay i know what's going on here and when victoria ends up back in her dressing room there's king marchand beaten up he clearly lost the fight with the gay guy in the gym and he says uh, i think we should try living together and she's like your place or mine then we cut back yet again to King and Victoria, they're in bed at uh, King's apartment, or his uh, hotel room, and they're talking, and Victoria says, let's uh, make a deal, and she says, uh, no secrets, no grudge collecting, if something bothers us, we tell each other immediately, and what's interesting about this line is, this was part of Julie Andrews and Blake Edwards' marriage vows, they said this to each other on their marriage vows, so... Uh, I think that it's just charming that they put it in the film. And then there's a series of <laughs> dates that they go on. He takes her to the boxing match. She throws up the minute there's blood. Uh, she takes him to the opera, Madame Butterfly, where she just crumbles into a puddle of, of goo because it's just too beautiful. And he doesn't know how to react to it. And and then there's a scene where they're dancing and in a, in a room full of men. Like it's a, a quite a large room, like a, a club a private club and all these men are dancing with each other and he's clearly uncomfortable like he's just uncomfortable he, so he's like okay let's go and he, they get outside and he says to squash take her home and he's like well what are you doing and he's like don't worry about me i'll be all right and he gets in a cab as they're driving down this alley this person gets thrown out of a bar, like bodily thrown, and he stops the cab and gets out and he goes into this bar and it's just clearly like just working class men. He goes up to the bar and he goes, milk. And this big tough guy gets up and walks over to him and goes, mother's milk or cow's milk? And he turns to this big guy and goes, how about your sisters? And they start fighting. It's just... <laughs> spectacular we cut back to chicago where norma jean has arrived and she's doing a nightclub number and it's my favorite number in this movie uh, leslie ann warren was a trained dancer she studied ballet and she was a singer she did a lot of musical theater and and stuff in her early career and this number wasn't part of the movie initially but after Blake Edwards saw her in her blonde hair, doing that, that accent created this number for her, which is Chicago, Illinois. And where Victor's nightclub act is very fabulous and elegant, this one's almost literally a strip tease. She's singing about the Windy City, and there's a couple of scenes where there's clearly a vent in the floor that blows her skirt. And, she's like, yeah! and as she's dancing, she keeps flashing people with this skirt. And then four other girls come out standing behind her in their underwear and they're all like, oh, oh, oh. And as that's happening, her dress literally blows up off of her and is gone. And now she's dancing in her underwear and she does this incredibly vulgarly sexy number. And she's just hilarious in it. She's so funny. And Sal Andretti's at the table and he's just like, he's got a cigar slack in his mouth. He's like, you can't believe he's watching this. And... After the number and the crowd goes wild, uh, she comes over to the table and she's like, <laughs> Hi, Sal. And he's like, what's going on, Norma? It's King. And he's like, what's he shacked up with another woman? And she goes, no, another guy. And he's like, what? And she's like, well, there's this Polish fairy, you see. The scene after that is King and Squash in a steam room. And then this guy walks in in a suit this is King's business partner, Sal Andretti. And he says to King, hello, faggot. Then there's King in his hotel room with Sal and Norma is with them. And she comes out of the bedroom holding a negligee and a lipstick. It's like, what, do you both take turns playing the guy? So while that's all going on, Squash ends up over at 
Victor's room and says, oh, King's business partner's here. She puts her coat on. It's like, come on. They walk into King's hotel room. Victor walks in and says, hello, darling, and kisses him. And everyone's like, oh. And then Victor turns to Norma and goes, Norma, can I talk to you for a minute? She goes, yeah, sure. What do you want? And he pushes her into the bedroom. It's like, get your mitts off me. And Squash whips out his gun and stops anybody from doing anything. And in the bedroom, Norma's now on the bed. And she's like, what's going on? What's happening? Hey. And Victor starts taking off his clothes. And she's like, what are you doing? Oh, oh, what's that? And then at one point, she's like, stop. Lock the door. And apparently, Leslie and Warren said she had lived that line. That wasn't in the script. They're all in the living room again. And you hear Norma screaming again. She comes tearing out of the bedroom with her blouse a little open and, you son of a bitch, he's a woman! <laughs> and, and, oh my God, I can't believe I have been doing this the whole time and haven't talked about Lara D'Souza's latest design. This is uh, uh, Miss Adelaide from Guys and Dolls in the uh, Pet Me Papa number where she's dressed as a cat. Now, I had this as a contest on my YouTube channel membership page for uh, anyone that was a new member of my channel and guessed where this was from because it's obscure unless you've watched guys and dolls because this wasn't in the musical this number pet me papa replaced i love you a bushel and a peck from the actual stage musical the uh they changed it out for this number because i guess it was sexier or more appealing i don't know but anyway so i just want to uh send uh, congratulations out to justin who uh Dread Pirate is his handle on uh, the interwebs, uh, who correctly, not only correctly identified this as from Guys and Dolls uh, and Miss Adelaide, but uh, I did a draw and he was the name I pulled. So congratulations to Justin. I'm going to do another draw with another design, uh, I think, soon. But uh, just just that, uh, just I, I can't believe I'm wearing this the whole time and not said anything about it. I just love that. I think Lar, between Lar and Denise, good grief. I'm so, in, I'm so impressed that I inspired them to be so generously talented. Anyway, next scene is at the nightclub. And Labis is there with uh, talking to uh, Andre Cassel. Uh, and he's got the police with them. And how they've executed a public fraud by having a woman tell everyone she's a man. And Andre's like, oh, that's crazy. <laughs> He goes into the dressing room and says, the police are here and Victoria's getting ready to do her Shady Dame from Seville number. And they leave it at that. Like you don't see the conversation they have, but clearly they tell Andre what's what. Andre comes out of the dressing room and says, uh, Inspector, please come in. And uh, Labisse goes to go with him and Andre stops him. Detective comes out of the dressing room and he goes, you idiot. If that's a woman, then she is wearing the, the greatest disguise I've ever seen. And, and Labisse is like, I don't know what happened. Uh, Andre turns to the closed door quickly. And then we cut back to the club and there's Victoria dressed as a woman walking down the, the, through the club to King's table. As she's walking down the club, a waiter goes by her with his back to us. And as they pass, she stops and goes, and keeps going and the waiter turns around and it's that waiter again and she sits at the table and king's like what's going on she's like, she's like shh, shh. and then the music starts and they look on stage and the way this number starts it's with all these uh matadors all in a line so you can't see the person at the end and when we get to the person at the end they have a a, a fan up and then the fan goes down it's robert preston <laughs> dressed as victoria for this final number a bit of trivia about this Robert Preston is wearing the same dress that Julie Andrews wore in the number. It's the exact same dress, and they designed it so that it could be adjusted to fit both of them. So it is exactly the same dress. The only difference is they've added an extra tier of ruffles at the bottom because he's taller than she is. And they also did the filming of this number in one take. It is brilliant. This number goes wrong so many ways. And the fact when you realize that they filmed it in one go, this is the best part of this movie and then there are flowers brought to the stage and people are clapping victoria's up on her feet squash is there toddy throws squash a rose from the bouquet they give him that's when the credits start rolling and it's just a beautiful ending to a very lovely film just the fact that we got robert preston in a movie doing that number in drag 
<laughs> I'm a happy person. My life is complete because of it. All right. I think I'm glittered up. We're going to uh, add some lashes and a uh, wig and the rest of it, and I'll be right back. And there's the look. What do you think? Of course, we're sporting the fabulous new wig from Denise Journeau, and the whole face is ColourPop. We used Blow and Smoke. We used On Cloud Blue. We also used the Glitter Gel, uh, You're a Firework. We also used the Setting Powders, Peach, and soft pink which i i don't know if you can tell i feel like my face isn't as ah in your <laughs> ah, angry and we uh, used this lipstick which is a uh, bloom super bloom and of course my nyx contour palette which i love and i don't go anywhere without my fumi desilu vold juvia's place queen's palette for my blush and my highlight i also use juvia's place foundation and eyelid primer uh this week so the film Victor Victoria, 1982. I was 16. This movie was huge for me. It's still huge for me. As I say, I watch it while I get ready in my drag. So this was an interesting episode to not watch it while I was doing it, but talk about it. It was different. I hope you enjoyed this walk down memory lane. If you haven't seen Victor Victoria, you can actually rent or buy it on YouTube. That is, if you don't have a place that you actually do go and rent or uh, download movies from. Also, I'm going to put the links for all of the products that I use today in the description box down below. Now, if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, what the heck is wrong with you? Why don't you commit? You know you want to. I do a new makeup and movies every Friday. And of course, we are knee deep in the hoopla of Drag Race Down Under. Drag Race España is on its way. And of course, All Star 6. Drag queen of the universe. I'm never going to have a life. I'm never going to have a life. I'm okay with that. So, until next time, miss me. Mwah. Seriously. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Delicious things to eat. The popcorn can't be beat. The sparkling drinks are just dandy, the chocolate bars and the candy. So let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat. Let's all go to the lobby to get ourselves a treat.